Well, welcome everyone to this webinar to mark the International Day for the Abolition of Slavery. Uh, and we'll be trying to answer this question, um, what is needed now to truly make slavery history? My name is Adrian Locke and I'm the founding director of the Deeper Leaders Collective. We're a group of uh, leadership consultants, uh, OD consultants and executive coaches that share a passion uh, that we need a deeper kind of leadership uh, in our communities and in our organizations. The kind of leadership that builds a kinder, a fairer and a more sustainable world. And I hope you'll agree uh, that those things are desperately needed today. Well, I'm delighted to introduce the rest of the panel. First of all, uh, uh, Eleanor Smith from the International Justice Mission. Say hello, Eleanor. Hiya. And also Peter Grant from uh, Agilus Consulting. Hello, everyone. And uh, the Countess of Coco herself, Nicola from Tony's Chocolony. Hi, everyone. And also delighted that uh, I'm joined by Simon Gott, another of the collective members who will be helping to facilitate the chat and the questions a little bit later on. Hey everyone, so if you've got any questions uh, as you're listening to the presentations, put them into the chat box and I can make sure we get those questions answered. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. So our agenda is fairly packed for the next hour or so. Uh, Ellen is going to give us a, a, an update of the situation on modern slavery across the globe as well as some of the work that IGM is doing uh, to counteract slavery. Then Peter's going to share from a report that's been published recently about the UK's uh, approach to tackling modern slavery through its aid programme. And then we're going to hear the story on, of an unusual chocolate bar from Nicola from Tony's Chocolony. I will then give you a brief update on the role of big business in tackling modern slavery. Is much progress being made? Uh, will be the question I'll be asking. Then there'll be a question time facilitated by Simon. And as he mentioned, uh, do put some uh, questions in the chat. If any urgent questions come that you'd like a speaker to answer, there might be a time just after we hear from each speaker to answer one of, their, one of those questions. Uh, but there will be a, a, a larger question time, a longer question time towards the end. We're then going to finish dead on five o'clock with five things leaders can do and five things citizens can do to combat slavery. And I'm going to give you an early Christmas present. I can hear the excitement building even now. And then from five o'clock onwards till about 5.30, we will have an open mic session. We're going to stop the recording. Uh, we're going to be recording the whole of the webinar from now. We're going to stop the recording at five o'clock and then have a, a much longer time for questions. Uh, the panel's going to stick around. Uh, and so if you can uh, join us for that, uh, then it'd be great to see you for a little bit longer after five o'clock as well. But without further delay, let me hand over to uh, Eleanor, who's going to take us into the first session. Over to you, Eleanor. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eleanor Smith, and I work at International Justice Mission, or IJM to its friends. We are the largest anti-slavery organisation in the world. Our mission is to protect people in poverty from violence by partnering with local authorities to help rescue victims, to bring criminals to justice, restore survivors to safety and strength, and help local law enforcement build a safe future that lasts. We partner with local authorities in 21 programme offices in 13 countries to combat slavery, violence against women and children, and other forms of abuse against people who are poor. We collaborate with local authorities to build communities where all people can expect to be safe and protected. On the next slide, there's a little map of where we work. And in the last 20 years, we have seen over 50,000 people free from oppression and violence, seen over 1,800 perpetrators held accountable for their actions in local courts, and trained over 216,000 people. Many of these successes have happened through partnerships with local governments. But today I want to focus in on our work on slavery. And first, it's always important to define our terms. So to define what we mean when we use sweeping statements like modern slavery. Slavery is an umbrella term for activities involved when one person obtains or holds another person in compelled service. It is fundamentally the, the exploitation of a vulnerability. People are tricked, forced, coerced under threat or actual violence into work sexual exploitation, criminal activity. 
debts are often used to hold victims in bondage, debts which they can never repay because they grow exponentially. And slavery exists in factories, farms and brothels, to name but a few places. The scale of it is somewhat unfathomable. It is estimated that 40 million people are in slavery today. That's more than at any other time in history, including the entire transatlantic slave trade. 25 million of those are trapped in forced labour slavery. And it is here that we're going to be focusing our attention today. Forced labour slavery, sometimes known as labour trafficking, bonded labour or forced labour exploitation, uses deception, threats or violence to coerce someone to work for little to no pay. Those trapped in these situations often make many of the everyday items we use. Chocolate clothes, coffees, batteries in our phones, the list goes on. And according to the Ethical Trading Initiative, it is estimated that 71% of companies believe that there is the likelihood of modern slavery occurring at some stage in their supply chains. This will be covered a little later in presentations by Peter and Nicola. For now, however, I want to take a moment to explain what International Justice Mission do, our theory of change, and how we're working around the world to end slavery in our lifetime. So IGM and our partners, if we go onto the next slide, we will strengthen justice systems. So we collaborate with governments and community leaders to respond effectively to violence. The thing is, the laws are there to protect people. It's just that the laws aren't always being enforced. And so we collaborate on the ground to train and equip justice systems to be the best they can. Secondly, we rescue and restore victims. We partner with local authorities to rescue victims from violence such as slavery and restore survivors to safety and stability. Every single survivor that IGM rescues receives a minimum two years aftercare with specialized trauma-informed care. Next, we bring criminals to justice. We work with justice system officials to ensure criminals are held accountable, thus stopping that cycle of violence. And we see that accountability leads to change because like all bullies, those who trade in humans are cowards. And when slavery moves from a low risk, high reward business to a high risk, low reward business, it is no longer an easy option, a quick win, a way to make money fast. And so there is a meaningful deterrent and thus it becomes less prevalent. And then finally, we scale demand for protection. We train and equip champions to advocate for protection across the world. That could look like training thousands of police officers in South Asia or raising up champions here in the UK to advocate for stricter sentences for those accessing online images of child sexual exploitation. So my next question, what does this look like practically? Well, let me introduce you to someone. Let me introduce you to Chandrama. When she was just eight years old, she touched silk for the first time. Throughout her childhood, she worked along with her sisters and their parents in a silk factory. Now, I don't know if you know how silk is made. I'm not completely sure of the intricate details, but it involves harvesting silkworm cocoons using boiling water and then spinning them on high speed spinning mills to make thread. It is fiddly, dangerous work and most certainly not suitable for an eight year old. At 15 years old, Chandrama was married and quickly had her firstborn son, but he sadly died just four years later. She later had a second son, but after her husband abandoned her, she was left all alone with no money and a little boy to care for. After searching desperately for jobs to make ends meet, she was forced to return to the very same silkworm factory she worked in as a little girl. She then remarried and had another baby, but knew that the short-lived jobs were no longer enough to care for her growing family. When she was promised a better paying job, she knew she didn't have a choice. And so Chandrama moved to another silkworm factory where she worked nonstop for 16 hours a day until her hands were swollen and cramped from handling silkworms all day in boiling water and spinning the silk thread. After she tried to escape, the factory owner locked her and her baby son in a dark cell for six months. Chandrama was left with that choice of using the two litre of water rations to either hydrate herself and her child 
or to bathe her baby son and prevent further painful rashes and boils. Unthinkable situation. Meanwhile, IJM's team in the city had begun investigating these two silkworm factories and in a sting operation, they, in partnership with local police, were able to rescue 161 people, including Chandrama. Many of the workers in the silkworm factories had faced near constant abuse and had developed skin diseases from the chemical exposure. Today, Chandrama is a strong spokeswoman for the fight to end slavery and a member of her local RBLA, which is the Released Bonded Labourers Association, and she is determined to help others find freedom too. She works for a wedding planner and is intently focused on bringing up her boys to have a better life. And the thing that strikes me about Chandrama's story is that it's not rare. My colleagues around the world rescue people from all sorts of types of product productions, sweet factories, rice mills, brick kilns, clothing factories, ginger farms, the list goes on. You see, slavery is more prevalent and more brutal than ever before, but it is also more stoppable than ever before. How do we know this? Does this theory of change work on a larger scale? Well, in a different context, there are lessons to be learned from some of our work in the Philippines. Back in 2007, IGM was given a grant from the Bill Gates Foundation in Cebu to train local police and work with local law enforcement to reduce minors available for sale in the commercial sex trade. IGM was given a target to reduce the sale of minors by 20% over a four year period, a high target for such a short time frame. So we went and activated our model by investigators finding minors and training local law enforcement and police to conduct rescue and bring the cases to court. Four years later, an independent body went in to monitor the impact and they found that the availability of minors for sale in the commercial sex trade had dropped by not just 20%, but by 79% in four years. This study was then also carried out in Manila and Pampanga and you can see the amazing results, 75%, 86%. You see, slavery is more prevalent and more brutal than ever before, but it is also more stoppable than ever before. And so as I come into land and before I pass back to Adrian, I want to leave you with the words of IGM's founder and CEO, Gary Haugen. Nothing happens just because we are aware of modern slavery, but nothing will ever happen until we are your voice matters. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, do throw them at me in the Q&A session later. But for now, I'll pass back to Adrian. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for getting us started. And uh, um, if you want to put your money behind uh, an organization that has a real impact there, you've got the evidence there. And we're delighted at Deeper Leaders that we are uh, supporting uh, IGM as one of our official charities. Uh, we give at least 10% of our, all our profits uh, to uh, causes that are, are close to our heart. And so we're delighted uh, to be able to support IGM and we'd recommend that to you all. Um, I'm just going to check with Simon to see whether there's any urgent uh, uh, questions of, of Eleanor before we move on. Yes, there, there is a question for you, Eleanor, um, from the chat room. It said, um, how does IGM decide which countries to work in? Because the, the map showed quite a varied picture. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, it's two main things. We Can we work with the government? We always work alongside local government um, in partnership with them. Uh, it depends on what the identified need is. Um, are there opportunities of par partnership on the ground? So it's, and can we, can we get the funding? Can we afford it? What's kind of happening there? So um, we, our work in Thailand, for example, um, started because um, Walmart approached us and was aware of trafficking in their supply chain with regards to fishing, but wanted to learn more about it. And so they commissioned a study over a number of years, we reported back and then they um, helped fund an office that began in Thailand. So it's, it's about partnership, it's about the need and it's about um, whether or not we can work with um, local government there and what the capacity is for that. Great, thanks Elena. Um, we're going to keep uh, moving and I'm going to hand over now to Peter um, to start his presentation. Thank you, Adrian. In March of this year, I was in Benin City in Nigeria. It was there that I met Samuel. 
In fact, I went to his market store by the side of the road. And amongst other things, I, I bought a handbag, rather nice one here for my daughter, Lucy. Samuel told me the story of how he'd been trafficked. As a young man, he'd fallen into debt. It all started with that. He just couldn't pay it back. But he had a friend in France who'd said to him that if he came to France, he could earn a lot of money and be able to pay back his debts. All he needed to do was to put up some money himself for the trip. So he sold his car, he sold his house, and he went on then to um, become uh, someone who set out on the route to trafficking. He discovered first of all that he was gonna travel for six days across the desert to get to Libya. He hadn't got any food or anything. He saw people die on the journey. When he got to Libya, the agent who was meant to be looking after him told him that actually he had to pay more money and then put him in prison until he was able to pay. He was locked up for four months until his family sent some money to set him free. He started working in Libya, but he then got kidnapped by a notorious group called the Asthma Boys, and he was put in an underground prison. This time there was nobody who could get money to him, and it was only when the Asthma Boys thought that he was about to die that they took him and dumped him by the side of a road. He recovered, and extraordinarily, he still wasn't put off going to Europe. He managed to get on a boat with 150 others, but then out from the shore in Libya, the engine failed, and they were 13 hours at sea. It was only then that the story turned round. They were picked up by the Libyan Coast Guard and by the United Nations. He was flown back to Nigeria and through a grant from the British government through the International Organization for Migration, he was set up in this new business that I'd come to see. And he's now a great advocate uh, for ending modern slavery around the world. I was in Benin City because for the last year, I've been the team leader of a review of modern slavery and the UK government's response to it. I was working for the Independent Commission for Aid Impact, and ICAI is an independent body reporting to Parliament that oversees how the UK spends its aid money, how it spends tax money on development. This review took us quickly into the complexities of modern slavery. As Eleanor said, it's, a, it's an umbrella term covering lots of different types of abuse. And it's also a controversial term. It's positive in that it looks back to the abolitionist movements of 200 years ago, but it's also seen by many as negative, as colonial, and many countries are in widespread denial about what's going on in their countries. We've already heard that an estimated 40 million people live in slavery. This map shows the distribution of the problem. No country is unaffected. Estimates in the UK uh, are very wide, but they suggest that somewhere between a lower estimate of 13,000, an upper estimate over 100,000 people are in slavery in the UK. If you look on this map, the particular focus of the green and yellow areas with higher incidence is across Africa, across West Asia, and across Southeast Asia. The drivers of modern slavery are poverty, a lack of the rule of law, and cultures and social norms that have accepted these practices often for centuries. All are hard to change, and COVID-19 is very much making it worse. The UK has committed over 200 million in aid funds to address the problem through the Home Office, who, who are keen to end trafficking to the UK, through the Foreign Office, and through the Department for International Development, the two now combined into a single ministry. This table gives you a rough breakdown of the government's modern slavery portfolio. It shows some of the different elements of modern slavery and shows that there's a big focus on, on trafficking, trying to reduce people coming to the UK, but also globally, on forced labor and on sexual exploitation. But it also highlights that some elements of modern slavery are very neglected. And during this study, I was, I was really struck by the cases of domestic servitude. Often young girls trafficked within their own countries from rural to urban areas, working as servants in countries where no one sees them. They don't have any rights. Uh, they often work for no pay 
and they're often subject to appalling abuse. The UK interest in giving priority to modern slavery is fairly recent. I put up this timetable not for the detail, but to highlight that the UK's first modern slavery strategy was only published in 2014. The groundbreaking Modern Slavery Act was then passed in 2015. So it's only six years or so that this has been a government priority. It's very closely associated with Theresa May, first as Home Secretary and then as Prime Minister, who took a personal lead on it. But one of our complaints was that the UK seemed to come to this uh, issue as though it was the first person to deal with it. And very often the government has failed to build on the work uh, that others have done, including work by the American government on trafficking in persons and work by the International Labour Organization on decent work over many decades. I don't have time to go through our report, which was published last month, but I would encourage you to read it on the ICAI website. This slide outlines some of our main conclusions. Positively, the UK government has raised awareness of modern slavery throughout the world through the Modern Slavery Act, making it a criminal offence and requiring companies above a certain size to put in an annual statement about what they're doing to remove modern slavery from their supply chains. And then in 2017 was the call to action where Theresa May went to the United Nations and asked all governments to sign up to end modern slavery and over 90 have done so. As I say, over 200 million has actually been spent on projects to end modern slavery, but sadly we found little evidence of impact. And some of our criticisms of the government's work was that survivors of slavery have not themselves been very much involved in designing programmes or suggesting directions that should be taken. The government hasn't really collected adequate evidence of what works. And in fact, there's no global repository of research that guides people with aid funds to know what the best ways are of ending modern slavery. We also concluded that better cooperation is needed. The government tends to try and do things on its own, but it should be working, we said, more closely with the private sector, many of whom are doing good things as well, and with other governments around the world, including in the destination countries for modern slaves. And as I said, some areas of modern slavery are neglected, and we look to the government to improve the balance of its portfolio. Finally, I'd like to come back to our country visits in March, just before lockdown. As well as Nigeria, we visited Bangladesh. And these photographs, particularly the one on the left and on the right, show the area of Dhaka, where many children, particularly young boys, work in the leather industry. I saw myself how they're subjected to dangerous chemicals, how their hours are not regulated, how they miss out on school because they're enslaved in this dangerous work. The other element of, of uh, migration or of slavery in, in Bangladesh is the many thousands, hundreds of thousands, particularly of women who go abroad from Bangladesh quite legally to work in garment factories and domestic work. They set out with high hopes, but very often they can be subject to abuse in the destination countries, in the Gulf, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia and little is done to help them there. Let me finish where I began in Nigeria, where we visited Lagos and Abuja, as well as Benin City. One of the major themes there was the huge numbers of women trafficked, particularly from Edo State, for sexual exploitation. And the UK government has helped to fund a, an advertising campaign called I'm Not For Sale, encouraging young women uh, not to go abroad in the hope of making lots of money. Sadly, there isn't much evidence that this kind of advertising works, but the parallel initiatives to provide alternative livelihoods and to encourage young people to make more of their lives in Nigeria are certainly worth supporting. Interesting, the British High Commission in Abuja told us that they reckon that about 1.3 million people in Nigeria are subject to modern slavery and that the majority of those are in domestic servitude often in the towns and cities across the country. So there's much more for the UK government and indeed for all governments to do to address these issues. And they're likely to be even more challenging for the UK because of the recently announced cuts to the aid programme, 
and because of the other pressing priorities such as COVID-19 and climate change. So much more to do. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for that uh, brief, brief summary of your report. As I do recommend uh, the report, we can make that available to you uh, a little bit later. Uh, I'll mention how you can access that report and read the fuller um, uh, findings of, of Peter's uh, study. Um, just want to check with, uh, with Simon, are there any urgent questions of Peter before we move on? So there was, there was a comment from Ruth in the chat box, which Peter might want to answer now or think about for the Q&A, which was, Ruth was interested in what were the what were the recommendations made in the report to have some significant impact. So I don't know whether you could um, give a brief summary of that now or wait for the Q and A. Yes, I'll, I'll briefly outline those. Um, first of all, we asked for the government to be more clear about its strategy. It hasn't published a strategy since 2014, and they've agreed to do a new strategy during 2021, which is great. Um, secondly, we asked the uh, the government to do more to spread modern slavery across all the aid programmes. So to look at modern slavery in education programmes, in health programmes uh, and across the piece and to really scale up what it's doing in that kind of way. As I said, we asked the, the government to work more closely with um, uh, other governments and particularly those in, in transit and destination countries and with the private sector. Um, we, asked, we asked the government to do more on the research side to put in place a much more systematic uh, approach to research and uh, thankfully they've they've agreed to do that so some of the, those are some of the main recommendations i can talk a bit more about the detail a bit later on great thank you peter okay without any further delay i'm going to hand over to nicola uh, who's going to share uh, her screen now and uh, take us through her presentation over to you nicola uh, so thank you for uh, having me. As uh, Adrian said, my official title at Tony's Chocolonely is the Countess of Coco. Um, and that basically means that I am the UK and Ireland marketing manager. So my job is to raise or issue awareness that there is slavery in the chocolate industry, but also that uh, there is brand awareness of Tony's Chocolonely um, as another option for people to choose from. So firstly, what I'm going to do is just give you a little introduction to us in the form of a video um, and you might recognize the person who is narrating it what's not to love about chocolate well two million children working illegally on cocoa plantations that's unfair kids playing f like a boss yes fair modern slavery to make a sweet luxury unfair equal rights equal opportunities fair big chocolate companies exploiting african communities no way that's unfair sharing wealth looking after each other fair chocolate can be a powerful force of change join tony's chocolate only make illegal child labor and modern day slavery a shame of the past Crazy about chocolate, serious about people. For those of you who haven't seen us yet, this is, uh, this is us, Tony's Chocolate Only. Um, and we are a chocolate company, but we like to think of ourselves as an impact company that makes chocolate, not a chocolate company that makes impact. Um, and this is our vision, a world where all chocolate is 100% slave free not just our chocolate, but all chocolate worldwide. And I think I'm here to kind of give the perspective of a company that is set up explicitly, uh, you know, a profit-making organization that's set up explicitly um, to end an aspect of modern slavery. And in this instant, um, that's chocolate. And to give you a bit of an overview of how big the issue is and the scale of it, um, this will give you an overview. So these are the two countries, Ivory Coast and Ghana in West Africa, where 60% of the world's cocoa comes from. So if you buy a chocolate bar from one of the world's biggest chocolate brands, you know, if you think of a, a big chocolate brand, it's likely that they buy their cocoa from those two countries. And in those two countries, there's over two and a half million smallholder farmers who each have on average about a hectare of land where they farm cocoa beans. And there's also 1.56 million children living and working on those farms. 
And that's actually the number of children that are living and working there illegally. 95% of them are actually working under what we would call hazardous conditions, which can mean anything from using pesticides, dangerous pesticides, carrying really heavy sacks of cocoa, using machetes and, and not going to school. And in the worst cases, there's at least 30,000 instances of what is classed as modern slavery. So as we've just been hearing, kids being trafficked from neighboring countries such as Burkina Faso on the promise of working on a cocoa farm and being able to send money back to their families. But actually what happens the majority of the time is that they are worked incredibly hard, not fed or looked after well, um, and definitely not paid. And very few of them actually see their families again. And this slide kind of shows where that inequality comes from. So as I said, on the left, you've got two and a half million cocoa farmers. On the right, you've got billions of chocolate lovers and consumers, just like many of us, I'm sure. And in the middle, you've got seven big chocolate companies that control all of the world's cocoa production. Um, and those are profit-making companies. So they, uh, it's in their best interest to keep the price of cocoa as low as possible to maximize their profits. And in our opinion at Tony's Chocolate Only, that price of cocoa is inhumanely low. And that leads to the root cause of the illegal labor that I was just talking about, which is systemic poverty. So you would think that if there was only seven big chocolate companies that were controlling all the world's chocolate production, that actually it would be you know, fairly easy to have a conversation with all of them and figure out a way to stop it. And that's what these two guys tried to do. Harkin and Engel are two US senators who back in 2001 uh, discovered the scale of illegal labor happening in the cocoa supply chain and wanted to actually pass a law that would make it illegal and that these big chocolate companies would be accountable for having illegal labor in their supply chains. Um, all seven of the CEOs ended up signing what is now called the Harkin Engel Protocol to say, to commit on behalf of their companies and also themselves personally, that they would reduce illegal and forced labor in their supply chains by 70% by 2005. But ultimately it was a self-regulated um, protocol that they were signing. There was actually no legal enforcement. And I think we all know that if things are all about self-regulation, they don't necessarily have the effect that we wish them to. And lo and behold, uh, there's been five or six different extensions to the protocol deadline. And um, the last deadline was 2020. Um, and the latest NORC report shows those statistics that I just talked about, that 1.56 million children are still working illegally on cocoa plantations. So at Tony's, we think that's not good enough. Um, we were set up in 2005 to explicitly tackle this issue. And over the last uh, eight years now, since 2012, we've had developed what we call our recipe for slave-free cocoa, which is also known as our five sourcing principles. And we believe that when all five of these principles are in place, you've really got the best chance of eradicating illegal labor from your supply chain. So no cherry picking, you can't just pick one or two, you have to do all of them because they work together in a very delicate system. And there's lots of chocolate companies that are doing some of these things, but very few, if any, are doing all of these things. So it starts with having a fully traceable supply chain. The world's big, biggest chocolate companies actually source cocoa as an anonymous commodity from a giant pile of anonymous beans. So they have no idea which farms they come from, what area they come from, who the people are at the start of the supply chain. And we do. So we know all seven and a half thousand farms. We have uh, GPS mapped them. We know all of the cocoa cooperative uh, managers and leaders. We invite them over to Amsterdam once a year to celebrate all our latest results with them. So we, and we trace the beans literally from the farm all the way over on the ship to Belgium to make the bars and then um, into your bars as well. So we know the human beings at the start of the supply chain and that has a real impact on, you know, treating them as equitable business partners um, versus just a sub, you know, a commodity. Secondly, we pay a higher price. So all of our cocoa beans are fair trade. So we pay the fair trade premium, but that isn't actually still enough to enable these farmers to earn a living income. So we bridge the gap with what we call the Tony's premium, which is a voluntary extra amount that we pay for our cocoa. We work with farmers for the long term, which means at least five years of guaranteed sales, which means they've got more security of income and they can invest ahead in things like better agricultural practices, professionalizing their equipment, planting more cocoa trees that take five years to bear fruit. 
We work with strong farmers and that means working with farmers who are part of a cooperative because that gives us more opportunity to help them professionalize. And finally, we work on helping farmers to improve their productivity and actually have less dependency on Cozico because if they're really heavily leveraged on just one product coming from their land, um, if that crop doesn't happen one year or with the impact of climate change, there's an issue, um, they could uh, be in a really sorry state um, when the cocoa season is done. So we help them diversify into other areas of farming as well. So that's what we're doing to make sure that we're reducing illegal child labor in our, our supply chain. But you know, we buy 7,000 tons of cocoa at the moment per year. Um, and the likes of Mondelez, one of the world's biggest, will buy 400,000 tons. So we are still a very tiny little drop in the ocean. So how are we going to change the whole industry, not just ours? We've created this roadmap. So it starts with creating awareness. So me telling you all today that there is an issue with slavery in the chocolate industry. We lead by example uh, with our uh, five sources of principles. So we're showing that you can be a successful, profitable um, chocolate company. We're actually the number one chocolate brand in the Netherlands. And finally, we want to inspire people to act. So inspire consumers to choose consciously. We want to inspire government to change legislation. Um, and ultimately we want to inspire the world's biggest chocolate companies to adopt our five sourcing principles. And we've made them open source via uh, something we call Tony's Open Chain. So we're willing to have conversations and coffees and chocolate with any chocolate company that wants to learn more about how we do things. Because our goal is to change the whole industry, not just change what we're, how we're making chocolate. So I mentioned um, legislation, uh, obviously Harkin and Engel really tried hard in 2001 to pass the necessary legislation to really change things in the industry. Um, and we're kind of taking up the mantle now at Tony's Chocolate Only and we've got a petition live. So if you all get out your phones, you can scan the QR code there or you can visit um, our petition page. Um, you can just Google Tony's Chocolate Only petition. And we are trying to get enough signatures to get legislation passed in the US, in Europe and in the UK that actually would make companies accountable for illegal child labor in their supply chain. And it would actually be you know, accountable by law rather than just self-regulation. And finally, just to wrap up, I wanted to invite you all to Tony's Fair, which is happening tomorrow night. Normally we would be in Amsterdam celebrating our annual results and having a big old party, uh, Tony style. But luckily for you guys, you don't have to go all the way to Amsterdam this year. You can just log on to fair.tonyschocoloni.com tomorrow at seven o'clock. And we're going to have a live show live from a studio in Amsterdam with some amazing speakers, including Kate Raworth, who is the, an economist and um, author of The Donut Economy. Idris Elba, who is um, a partner of ours and very passionate about empowering West Africa. David Benoa, who is a creative and amazing storyteller, who is telling beautiful stories about West Africa. And Akwazi as well, who is a Dutch change maker. And the theme of tomorrow night is all about raising the bar for social change. So I will see you there. I'm more than happy to take any of your questions. Thanks, Nicola. And uh, not only is that an inspiring story, it's fantastic toasting chocolate as well. If you have encountered Tony's Chocoloni and have a favorite flavor, then do post that in the chat. I'd be really interested to hear what yours is. I've just started my uh, special Christmas edition, uh, Dark mint candy cane and i'm certain that's rapidly becoming one of my favorites uh, i know i think we've got time for just one question if there is one uh, simon before we move on yeah there were two or three in there for you for you nicola but the one that i picked out is um there seems to be a lot of fair trade chocolate available in big supermarkets it is the question was is that a screen or is that is it genuine no, it's absolutely genuine. And what fair trade do is great. Um, you know, we're, we're a partner of theirs. The very first red Tony's bar looks exactly like this was the first fair trade bar in the Netherlands. Um, but fair trade is, is a great start. Um, you know, to have a fair trade certification, you have to guarantee and say that there will be no illegal labor on your farm. However, until the businesses themselves take full responsibility for their supply chain, you can never guarantee it. And it actually takes a lot more than just what fair trade are doing. So we really want to put the onus on the businesses and the brands and those corporates themselves to take full responsibility for their supply chain, make it traceable um, and ultimately pay more because um, as a certification, fair trade can't, can't say you have to pay the living income reference price because nobody would buy the chocolate. So that uh, definitely comes back to the brand themselves 
sharing the profits more equally through the value chain, which is what we, we do at Tony's. But no, fair trade's a great start. Absolutely look out for that. Uh, but we want companies to do a lot more. Great. Thanks ever so much, Nicola. Uh, we'll hear a bit more from you uh, later on in, uh, in the question time, but uh, let, let's move on. Uh, can I just ask uh, people to um, mute their microphones? We're getting a little bit of interference in the background uh, until you're ready to speak and ask a question a bit later on. Well, what I'd like to do now is to spend a few minutes uh, giving you an update on the role of business in addressing modern slavery. Because one of the questions I've had in my mind for a little while is, have any corporations gone beyond their fine sounding modern slavery statements to really alter their practice? Well, uh, you can actually get a very up-to-date picture of this if you visit uh, the modernslaveryregistry.org. And this is actually just a couple of days ago on the 30th of November. And you can see that in terms of UK companies, only 30% are meeting all the minimum requirements set out in the UK Modern Slavery Act. So massive way to go on that. I know we're focusing a bit on, on the UK just here, but my hope is, in fact, on, the, on this registry, there are stories of what's going on in other countries as well. So if you are joining us from another country, there's some useful information there uh, broader than the UK as well. But loads still to do in the UK, according to the Slavery Act. But one of the most details reports recently was published in 2018, three years after the Modern Slavery Act was uh, introduced. And it looked at what was happening in the FTSE 100 companies. Business and, and Human Rights Resource Centre set up a, a kind of a standard, the number of indicators that, that you could score up to 100% if you met all the requirements of this standard. But the key finding from the study was this, and this is a direct quote. Three years on, most companies still publish generic statements committing to fight modern slavery without explaining how. Sadly, only a handful of leading companies have demonstrated a genuine effort in their reporting to mitigate the risks. You're probably interested to know which ones they are. Well, I'm happy to say that uh, M&S stands out uh, head and shoulders actually above the others because out of that 100% score, they are the only uh, company that scores 78% in the 70s. There are others that follow uh, on in the low 60%. And you'll see a number of the supermarkets there are starting to take this issue seriously, but still some way to go. Uh, if they were uh, on the stock exchange, the co-op will probably be there, Waitrose uh, will probably be there, John Lewis will probably be there, there as well. But these are just FTSE 100 companies. Just behind uh, those are those that are just over 50% score against the, the standard that uh, Business and Human Rights Resource Centre set. So plenty more to do out of all of the, the 100 in the FTSE 100. Lots more work to do there. I was interested to know also what influences big business the most. And this particular study uh, in, in 2018 did start to address that issue. It was one put out by Ashridge Holt, combined with the Ethical Trading Initiative, the ETI. And they did an online survey of 51 companies and, and in-depth in interviews of 21 brands and retailers. And they looked at the top drivers of change. And the top two, first of all, reputational risk. And the second, the Ethical Trading Initiative base code. You may not be familiar with this, so let me just give you a quick overview of what it covers. It's these nine areas about freely choosing a job, no coercion there. It's about um, the rights of joining a union, working conditions, uh, no child labour, living wages paid, working hours not being excessive, no discrimination in the workplace, regular em employment is provided, uh, and no harsh or inhumane treatment. Is and companies are allowed to sign up to this initiative and be reported against it. Apart from that, senior leadership passion, organizational vision, legislation and global frameworks do have an impact. And then ones I'm particularly interested in, the views of staff and the views of customers. I'm gonna come back to those a little bit later as we look at what we can do as leaders, but also what we can do as citizens to make a difference. But I'm gonna pause there and hand back to Simon uh, because we're going to go into a time of, of questions at this stage. Thanks, Adrian. We've got, we've got loads of questions here, so I don't know if we're going to get time to cover all of them. Um, but as Adrian said at the start, we're going to do a, an unrecorded open mic from 5 till 5.30. So if your question doesn't get answered, please stay on and, and, and we can talk about those afterwards. So I'm going to start with Eleanor. Um, one of the questions for you, Eleanor, was the issue of modern slavery is very rampant in sub-Saharan Africa. 
So this person wanted to know what's the engagement of IGM in countries in that region? Yeah, great question. Um, we have um, two offices. We have one in Uganda and one in Kenya. Um, neither of those focus um, on slavery specifically. So um, with regards to Kenya, we look at police abuse of power. And with our Uganda office, it's um, around violence against women and children. Um, so at the moment, uh, we currently have no offices working directly with the issue of slavery in sub-Saharan Africa, but um, I think there are conversations ongoing about where we might be able to expand to next, as kind of um, suggested by a previous answer to question, it depends who we can work with, the prevalence, um, and what that's going to look like for us. But yeah, thanks for that question. Great one. Thanks, Helena. Peter, if you don't mind, I'm going to move on to you with the next question. So this this question came from Nathaniel, and it was, it was on the back of your comment around there being no global repository to understand the, the impact and effect. Um, Nathaniel's asking if, if you and your colleagues have any ideas on how that global repository could be created and what can citizens do to, you know, to, to contribute towards that? Thank you, yes. Well, the government has made two attempts at this. So there's, there's something run by the United Nations called Delta 8.7, which has the basis for being that global repository. And the government put 1.6 million pounds into that, which is, which is a great start. But I did some work about three years ago uh, for an equivalent study looking at violence against women and girls. And there the government decided to invest 25 million pounds in a research center on what works based in South Africa. And that really has become a global powerhouse of pulling together research, of being able to drive the agenda for what should be done. And I think what's needed is, is to put more resources into the Delta 8.7 platform or others just to build that up. You know, it, it, it's just a big effort to, to draw together. There's a lot of research that has go on, gone on. I think we're just not making the best use of it. Thank you, Peter. So Nicola, I'm going to come over to you now. Um, Ray Smith asked, is there an issue about reducing the availability of, of cocoa plant and, and root stock? Um, is there, is there anything that, that Tony's can do in, in that area? Yeah, so there's definitely, definitely part of the problem is, um, you know, the health of, of cocoa plants on the plantations. Um, and that can come from uh, issues of climate change or, you know, plants just being old. And they take cocoa plants um, and trees take five years to bear fruit. But quite often, you know, if cocoa farmers and their families are selling stock year to year and they don't know who or they're going to sell to or how much they're going to sell the following year, it's a big risk for them to really take uh, that investment and take that time to grow new plants. And that's where the risk of deforestation comes in because lots of farmers will then just move to other land and farm new, um, uh, build new plants whilst keeping their other ones going. So that's why I was talking about the five sorts and principles really working delicately in a system together. We can't just get more and more farmers to make more cocoa because that leads to deforestation. Um, and that's why we have our five year partnerships with our farmers as well, our partner farmers. So they know that they're getting income for five years, which actually gives them the freedom to grow those new plants, to use better pesticides that aren't um, you know, ruining their land, to invest in soil regeneration and to invest in better farming practices. Um, so absolutely, it's an issue and something that our five source of principles definitely look to uh, address. That yeah, it. yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Eleanor, can, can I come back to you with another question for you? So um, I think this was Claire and Alex that asked, um, are IGM seeing the drivers of slavery also increasing? So, you know, at the moment, climate, climate change, COVID, are they driving an increase in slavery? Are you seeing that? Yeah, that's um, a hard question. Um because, I mean, with the COVID thing, it's only just beginning. Um, climate change and uh, other things. I think the, the way that we talk about it at IGM is that um, it's um, poverty leads to violence and a lack of uh, protection leads to violence. Poverty has many causes, climate change, COVID, any number of other things. And so um, what we are seeking to do is um, stop the violence that, um, that is a result of the poverty. And so in some ways, yes, but in other ways it's reducing. So it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a difficult question to kind of quantify 
um, uh, particularly because a significant amount of slavery is hidden. You heard, we heard Peter talk about domestic servitude, for example, um, which is completely um, really hard, really hidden within communities. Um, so yes and no, hard to say. Poverty leads to violence. Poverty has many causes um, and violence takes the form of slavery. Maybe Feel free to come back to me on that though. <laughs> perhaps if I could just follow up on that one as well. Um, the UK government in the early stages of COVID did commission some research in South Asia. And what that was showing was that people's vulnerability to modern slavery was increasing for reasons that you'd, you'd expect really. A lot of people losing their jobs, uh, often migrant laborers and the most vulnerable are the ones who lose their work first. Um, and one of the things that really struck me was the way, you know, our shops close. So the people providing the garments to those shops cancel their orders to factories in, in Bangladesh, in, in uh, elsewhere in South Asia. So those women are then immediately thrown out of work. Uh, and it's the knock on impact of these things that are making people more vulnerable uh, to modern slavery in all its forms. Thank you, Peter. Um, just, to, just to carry on that point a little bit further, but one of the questions was about um, servitude in, in manufacturing industries. So what, what's being done to dissuade customers, consumers of those, you know, those products? So, you know, what's been, been could you see being done at a, a kind of a government level to dissuade people from buying those products? I think, I think the answer is various. One of the things is the Modern Slavery Act, which really is trying to put pressure on companies to sort out their own supply chains. Um, that's, that's step one, but as Adrian has shown, um, you know, it's still got a long way to go. I think as consumers, uh, we really have to ask questions about any goods that are too cheap. Uh, if, it's, if it's too cheap, it's, it's, it's quite likely that it's subject to abuse in its production. And it's worth researching that. I think if you're a, a customer of a company, you can, you can ask them what their policies are. Even better if you're a shareholder or if you're a, a, an employee, um, there are lots of schemes, they vary from sector to sector, you know, in, in the carpet industry, in the fashion industry and so on. So it takes a bit of work, but you can unearth what's going on and you can therefore make better choices in your own shopping. Great, if thanks Peter. Add, if I can add to that as well, um, uh, I subscribe to the Ethical Consumer magazine, which comes out every month. And they are, are very good at just giving you a lowdown about which are the eth most ethical brands not just on the slavery issue, but on sustainability uh, as well. And so I would recommend that's a source. Some of it you can you can access from their website online, um, but um, it's worth getting the, the their regular update um, by subscribing as well. Thanks, Adrian. There's loads more questions coming in, but I think we've got time for one more that's going to be for Nicola. Um, but those people that haven't had your questions answered yet, please hang on after after five o'clock, and we can get to those questions. Nicola. Um, what is your strategy for persuading other chocolate companies to get up to speed and come in line with Tony's standards? Yeah, great question, because that's that's the biggie, right? Uh, but it all comes down to our three pillar roadmap. So that's how that's what we've created to really put pressure on uh, the biggest chocolate companies. So if we can create enough awareness amongst consumers who can then choose consciously and actually, you know, we don't want to people to boycott their favorite chocolate bars we want to do you know exactly what adrian just said we want people to ask their favorite chocolate companies what are you doing to ensure that i can eat this bar without worrying that there's illegal labor in the supply chain so if we're educating consumers we're also educating retailers so we've got really great relationships with all of the retailers where we're stopped and it's a big part of our uh, work with them to get them to look at their own sourcing as well and also to ask questions of the other brands that they stock um, and also, if we get, you know, consumer demand, consumer pressure, retailer pressure, and then this legislative pressure, suddenly that's a lot of downward pressure, hopefully on these big chocolate companies. And if they're not going to do it just for, you know, doing good and wanting to prevent it themselves, then hopefully all of those external forces will lead to them being inspired to act and make positive changes. That's they're all great. doing it. They're all doing lots of positive things. It's just not enough yet. So we just want to give them that extra push. Brilliant. Thanks, Nicola. So I'm going to hand that back over to Adrian now. So I think, Adrian, with your concluding slides, you, there's a way of kind of pulling all this together in what are some of the practical actions we can take. Just, just before you do, a few people have asked about um, whether the webinar is going to be available uh, as, as a recording afterwards. 
it will be available on the deeper leaders website from next week adrian so you can look back at it there over to you thanks Simon. so just to for finish up um five things leaders can do to make a difference uh, and be a part of abolishing modern slavery first of all face the uncomfortable truth know what's going on in your supply chain Often uh, companies only know what's happening at the tier one level, but really they need to know what's happening well below that because so much goes on outside of their view that they really do need to face. Uh, a number of, of company executives have testified to actually going and seeing the conditions and being a major force for them to actually take this really seriously. Secondly, commit, sign up perhaps to the, uh, uh, the ETI base code that I showed you a bit earlier and be willing to hold yourselves publicly accountable. To, to tackling this issue. Three, work in partnership with your supply chain to become slavery free. It's not just a question of policing and monitoring. They need to change their ways as well. So why not work in partnership to help them, uh, to help you to make sure that your supply chain is slavery free. Be proactive. Don't wait for the reputational damage that's coming your way because I can predict that there will be growing pressure from uh, the public in general, as well as consumers and those that use your services, to, to know what you are doing to combat this massive and horrible issue. And fifthly, be a deeper leader. Don't just laminate your corporate values, live them. And so many of you have, have got corporate values, which include diversity and respect. Well, this is where the rub hits the road. We need to be able to live these out in the way that we are doing our business and providing the service we, we provide. Um, five things we can all do as citizens. Face the uncomfortable truth. As Peter says, currently, this is a horrible thing to say, but we all employ slaves. If we are buying some of that cheap stuff, which has very likely got slavery in the supply chain somewhere. Commit, be willing to pay more if you can afford it. I'm not, this is not laying a guilt trip on those that actually are finding it very difficult to make ends meet. But if you can afford it, be willing to pay more if you know that that supply chain for that material uh, is going to be free of slavery. Use your consumer power, choose justice uh, through your consumer choices. Join the campaign, support IJM and Tony's and others like them that are doing some great work in this area. We really can make a difference uh, if we work together. Fourthly, demand more from our governments, uh, big brands and, and your employer. Write to your MP, uh, write to, to your favorite brands uh, and ask them and put pressure on them make the reputational commercial risks real for them and i think we will get more momentum and finally be a deeper citizen eat more chocolate um as long as it's like, as long as it's slavery free although that might end up being a wider citizen rather than just a deeper citizen but anyway you know what i mean uh, the, the chance is there to enjoy some of the things that we love but with a conscience free of feeling that we are contributing to the problem rather than being part of the solution to, to demolish slavery across the world so that's it from us. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, your early Christmas present, by the way, uh, if you sign up uh, at our Deeper Leaders website, there's a resources tab there when you will have free access to a whole range of resources, uh, which will inform you some more. Uh, all of the reports that we've mentioned uh, and, the, and the websites and standards we've mentioned are there uh, on that uh, resources hub. It's a growing hub. If you join up, then you can contribute to us growing an educational resource uh, for people that really want to make a difference and to contribute towards a kinder, fairer and more sustainable world. So that's it from us. But before you go, just one challenge for you. If something has moved you in this presentation today and you are deciding to do something differently, we just invite you before you sign off to just put that in chat saying, I commit to this. Uh, and it'd be great to see some of the impacts of what we've been saying has had on, on you. So we're going to stop recording there uh, and we're going to go over to a, a, an open mic session.